Hello listeners, hello video viewers, welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. This episode is a conversation with James Harris, who is a writer, comedian, English teacher, translator, language learner, uh, lots of different things. Uh, James was first on this podcast back in episode number 670, uh, when we talked about his background and going to Oxford University and stuff. He's back on the podcast today because he's written a book and he's going to tell us a few things about it and read some excellent extracts from it for us as well. And we get to talk about various other things that relate to things like language learning and communicating and things like that. Okay, so I hope you enjoy the conversation. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out James's book as well. The link is in the description. So here we go. Hello, James. Welcome back onto the podcast. How are you? I'm great. It's lovely to be back. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah, you too. I, I have to comment on your tiny microphone at the very beginning of this. People watching the video will see that James um, is holding a, a tiny little microphone, which makes him look a bit like he's on the Death Star talking to R2-D2 or something like that. <laughs> yeah, we were told at school it's not the size of your microphone, but what you do with it. So, uh, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I would have a job to do too much with this. But I, I, bought, I bought an extremely tiny microphone, which I thought would add to the experience today. Yeah, it's... it's uh it's supposed to clip onto your shirt, of course, uh, but uh, it actually we've we've discovered it works much better if you hold it in front of yourself. You look like a giant stand-up comedian. Yeah, as opposed to uh, an extremely small one, which is my uh, actual destiny. But uh, visually, uh, <laughs> visually, I, I, I agree with that um, comment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, are you in London at the moment? I am. I've, uh, I last spoke to you. I think it was in 2020 because it was when all the pandemic um, was just getting started and wasn't that fun. Um, but um, yeah, I've actually moved since then. So I'm now in southwest London. Um, I'm in the uh -huh. suburbs uh, now. So I'm, I'm living a very suburban existence. But I do live opposite a train station, um, which is basically, I think, every, every boy's dream. Uh, so I get, to, I get to watch trains go past my window all day, which is actually, first time you move in, rather stressful. But as time goes on, actually quite soothing, watching, watching trains go by all day. Mm. That sounds nice. Yeah, the last time you were on this podcast and the first time was in episode 670. And we talked about stuff like your background and going to Oxford University and learning languages and stuff like that. Um, and that was, yeah, we spoke in the middle of lockdown. Um, how, by the way, how are, how is your language learning coming along? Well, my language learning has come along. I mean, um, I've been working with my languages. I've been doing interpreting work um, with with German, which is my strongest foreign language, uh, and I continue uh, to 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 work on my Chinese because my wife is Chinese. Um, but obviously, with China being shut shut down for the last few years, uh, not only have I not been allowed to go there, um, my wife hasn't been allowed to go there either. So she hasn't been home in over two years now. Um, so hopefully, she will be able to to soon. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, for me, the learning languages and, and spending time with that is a, a lifelong pursuit. What's your What's your way of uh, working on your Chinese? What's your preferred way of well, doing I hear, that? I hear it every day, um, and it probably says something that my insults vocabulary in Chinese is now pretty sophisticated, um, and yeah. I, I tend to get a lot of abuse, uh, and uh, I can give a little bit back now. Which is uh, which is an incentive, yeah. Who do you get abuse from? Well, I mean, Chinese uh, people are very uh, are famously very direct and very uh, <laughs> and, and very insulting, um, uh, uh, and um, I mean, you have to obviously be a certain kind of person to view that as an incentive to to uh, spend time with the language. Um, but I remember... I, and and to marry one of them as well. Yeah, it was clear before we got married that I was going to be getting a lot of um, <laughs> invective in my direction. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just found it really funny. Um, I have... Uh, maybe it's a Midlands thing. I'm from Nottingham. But I've always thought mm. Midlands... Mid this is one of my little theories about comedy is that there is a distinctive sense of humour in the Midlands, right? Which isn't mm -hmm. quite the same as the North and which isn't quite the same as the South. Um, yeah, it's better. It's, it's, it's the best humour. I'm, I'm from the Midlands as well. Well, where are you from? Um, I'm from Solihull. Well, exactly. It is very similar, and it's, it's something to do with the accent, but it's, uh, it is often quite rude in a friendly way, uh, in, a sort, yeah. in a sort of mocking way, but it tends to be a bit 
northern people have that as well, but Midlands tend to mock you in a bit of a weirder way. So it's a bit more, yeah. it's, a, it's a bit odder when Midlands people like insult each other. It's a, bit, <laughs> it's a bit like, am I? But anyway, there's no such questions with Chinese because you know when you're being insulted. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's um, uh, so the, a regular occurrence, for example, would be we will turn on the uh, the the uh, Chinese app um, WeChat, which is the yeah. uh, the most common app. Uh, mm -hmm. to see my 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 mother my um, wife's mother-in-law and my father-in-law um and they wait will, your your my, my, your mother in yeah that, that <laughs> not your confusing. wife's mother -in it's, it's it's early it's early yeah okay but it's not that much uh that would be a real story yeah I mean, yeah it would be your mother-in-law my mother that's your wife's mum with your with you yeah anyway yeah. anyway uh we turn it on and the first thing they say is he's looking fat or he, ah. he, he looks fat this week or i think he's put on weight uh, and so I'm, I can quite, I can normally understand what's being said about me. me. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's um, that's the experience I'm having. Um, okay. But yeah, no. So Chinese is the is is the priority, and I continue to try and keep up my other languages, which are German and French, as and obviously English. So it's mainly just sort of trying to talk to your wife's family. Is this it, or is there a more formal approach that you're taking? Well, I've, with taken, Chinese? I've taken class. Uh, I have taken mm -hmm. class, and I've gathered quite a lot of um, materials by now. Uh, I did uh, pay for an app for a while, which is called Fluent U, which I would recommend, oh, yeah. um, and has just about every language. So anybody who's learning a language, uh, and what they do is they they basically take clips off Chinese social media, put subtitles on it. Uh, in yeah. um, in Chinese, and then give you a quiz about what you've just watched. And I had I that see. for two years, and I found that quite useful. Um, one of the problems, though, is that Chinese has lots and lots of different accents and dialects and ways of um, uh, ways of, of speaking it, and I don't really have any sense of that, um, you know, from where right. I'm learning it. Yeah, it's just lots of people insulting you in slightly different voices. Well, no, it's the local voice. Uh, so it's that I am being insulted in the... If, if we want to get specific uh, with your listeners, I'm being insulted mm -hmm. in the Guangxi or Guilin dialect of Chinese. Uh, I, I can share with your listeners my favourite insult in that dialect, which is... I was about to yeah, ask, in yeah. fact. Go ahead, it's please. Very, it's very mild, So, but it, but it, yeah. has, it has a powerful connotation. Halloween, Halloween, uh, and that means silly egg. Halloween. Okay, so if you call someone, a, if you're in, if you are in the famously beautiful city of Guilin, don't say that to anybody. But you could, really? you could communicate that you know it. Halloween, uh, silly egg, and it is, a, it is, a, it is a great insult. Is that a powerful insult in that part of the country? Then it is, and it's much worse than you'd think for just calling someone a silly egg. It's actually pretty inf offensive to call someone a, a silly egg. Okay, so your insults are coming along. That's good. And um, so since I spoke to you, one of the things you've done is that you've written a book. Well, I've, I'd actually written the book beforehand, but I've, I've, oh. I've, I brought the book out, uh, which, okay. is, uh, which is here. I've, I've got it here if you want to uh, I'll show you. Please. This is my novel, Midlands. Um, Midlands, I've pronounced it a very weird way. Midlands. <laughs> um, so links very nicely to our earlier discussion, yeah. Um, so I published this in July. Um, of um, of this year, it is self published. I didn't get anyone to publish it for me, uh, but I started a Substack newsletter about two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Well, not two years ago, eighteen months, and it's grown uh, quite a lot. So I figured, well, that, that's that's what. What did you start? Sorry, uh, a Substack newsletter. So I write a weekly newsletter, which I started um, September twenty twenty one. So it's been going just over a year now, uh, mm -hmm. and it's gr it's growing quite well. I've got quite a decent audience over there. Um, one email a week writing about all kinds of things. So I thought, well, you know, now for probably for the first time in my life, I've actually got a bit of an audience for my writing, um, you know, which is a different thing from, from, from stand up, obviously, because that's some, some that you go and the audience is there or not there. But I actually yeah. had, had a kind of dedicated audience. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, I've got this, this novel, which I'm quite proud of. Um, so I, I will I will bring it out and it's been good yeah it's been good the feedback's been good um, I've not I'm not finished with it yet because I'm gonna I'm gonna keep plugging it and um, tr trying to get it out there it is obviously just me going around telling people to buy it I mean I think I've 
convinced probably every individual person who's bought it that they, they have to buy it uh, but that's that's worked now, now nearly a hundred times so you know that's that's okay um yeah and yeah. it's um it's a book which is long in the making because i actually started writing it 10 years ago and it probably the the, the main work was finished by 2015 it's had a bit of tinkering since then but it has been a very a very slow genesis okay so what's the book about well, the book ties in quite nicely to some of the stuff people on your podcast are interested in because when I was a young man, and this is um, what we spoke about on the on the earlier edition of the podcast, I went out to Germany. Um, I was probably 22 when I, when I first went out. No, I was 21 when I first went out there and I came back to London. I never lived in London before, but I came back to the UK um, at, on the day of my 31st birthday. So I basically had a decade in, in Germany. Um, and while I was there, I actually developed a relatively successful career as a, as a stand-up comedian. We, we don't need to go overboard with the success because it wasn't like, mm-hmm. I wasn't like the Justin Bieber of uh, late 2000s Germany. <laughs> um, although Bieber does mean beaver in German. So, so you know. Beaver. He, yeah, he's a German name. Bieber is beaver. Yeah, so he, he was, um, he was really... Uh, he, he had an ancestral connection or has an ancestral connection to Germany, clearly. With so, the beavers. Yeah, with beavers specifically, the wonderful he's actually a be- He's actually a beaver. Justin Bieber, no one realises that he's actually descended from beavers. Yeah, although, uh, yeah, I mean, he's descended from people maybe who made a living by selling beaver furs. It's probably more likely. <laughs> <laughs> and I prefer the idea that he's descended from beavers. I think that's a much, much more, that's maybe the secret to his success. Everyone's like, why is Justin Bieber so successful? He's like, ah, you don't realise because he's actually a beaver in dis- disguised as a human. Yeah, I mean, nowadays I'm at the age where, <laughs> where, where like, I, I check in with a hip pop culture reference and they're like, that was, that was six years ago and i'm like I've, yeah. I've, I've worked hard to keep that one up to date so <laughs> just in beef <laughs> so so like i mean i don't what i'm trying to say is there's probably quite a big gap in my knowledge of what justin bieber's if if he can still be considered successful etc etc but what i can tell you is that probably about 300 years ago justin bieber's family were living in karlsruhe in germany either being beavers or selling beaver hides as we, right. as we have not <laughs> agreed on but we've got two different fear- theories there yeah okay yeah um uh, so, uh, yeah uh, how did we end up talking about justin Bieber? I, d- uh, I said that uh, although i was in germany i had a bit of yeah. success um yeah but i you also, weren't exactly the i was justin Bieber. but i was of, uh, i was i was going around doing big gigs i went all over europe and i was making a bit of money and that's when i met you obviously which would have probably been yeah. about 2011 12 probably around then yeah, yeah. maybe 13 14 yeah something you're, like that you're, he's very modest you're, you probably don't say this to listeners but when i when i saw luke performing he was actually very funny um oh. so, so I, I remember the set very well i think you closed it off and it was it was it was very funny um so anyway oh, thanks that's that's very much now back in the day when people were like well justin bieber you're quite hip aren't you um so mm. um but what I was having was this really fascinating cultural experience of being someone who'd come to a foreign country and developed a kind of act. And I was having all these weird experiences and I just wanted to start writing them down. The other thing I was thinking about a lot was um, there aren't that many novels, etc., about stand-up comedians, but those that are tend to be quite unrepresentative of what stand-up comedy is actually like. Um, you get stuff like Joker, you know, the DC movie where the Joker's a kind of frustrated comic, but also a kind of murderer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and like, we've, we've all had a bad gig. <laughs> that's, that's also that cliche of like, oh, you're a comedian. Oh, aren't a comedian's all really messed up, which yeah. is another kind of cliche. Exactly. And once you, once you go through the famous books and novels and films about comedians, comedians, almost all of them are like that. They're all kind of tortured, um, uh, borderline homicidal, suicidal, you know, there's, and so I, I basically, I wanted to communicate a couple of things about doing comedy. One, it's very boring. There's a lot of waiting around. Um, comedians tend to be quite serious and obsessive about their comedy, uh, but it's also really fun or you wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, uh, and so so the book is an attempt to capture kind of life as a road comic in Germany in the early 2010s, inspired by a little tour I went on. It is fictionalised to the extent that I've put a lot of stuff in there that didn't happen to try and make it a bit more interesting. 
um, but not beyond not beyond like anything which couldn't have happened. I think. Mm-hmm. Well, what are some of those weird things that you've experienced then as a comedian on the road? What sort of thing you're talking about? Well, I mean, this isn't actually in the book, but uh, it, it gives you a little example of how weird the space I was playing in. I, I, I was booked to do a gig in Bayreuth, okay? Bayreuth, B-A-Y-R-E-U-T-H. Normally pronounced like Beirut in English, but it's Bayreuth mm-hmm. in German. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the Wagner town, okay? It's the f- famous for being the town where Wagner put all his, all his operas on. And um, I went down there to do a gig, and uh, I was booked because someone had seen me doing a routine in a club in Berlin, um, which was a little bit, um, uh, shall we say, um, how could we say, a bit smutty. Uh, was, was smutty a bit smutty yeah Sm- uh, we're going to need to explain smutty yeah a little bit a little bit um oh god it's, it's difficult to explain smutty isn't it uh what the french call bit ooh la la a little bit a little bit risque um, mm-hmm. so a bit rude a and bit, in a, a sexual yeah. in a sexual sense no i, I don't sexual know. content yeah exactly in a sexual sense i don't know how i uh your listeners, how, what I'm allowed to say, etc. on this podcast. You can say but, pretty much anything you want, I, okay. I would say. Well, basically, the routine was uh, relating to the Nazis and S&M, okay? It wasn't okay. the kind of thing which I normally do, but I had a quite a funny idea. A um, lot, of, uh, lot my, of leather and My stuff. idea was basically the Nazis were the biggest S&M fetishists in history. S- uh, S&M. Yeah, and, uh, SS&M, as you could say. <laughs> and they, they all, like, basically it was an all excuse to wear, like, your fetish gear in public, which... Um, which Tight leather trousers. Exactly, and, yeah. a, a lot of that, all that stuff. And it wasn't the kind of stuff which I normally do, but it seems to be that on this one time, this person saw it and they thought it was really funny, so they booked me for this gig. But I didn't do it in the gig they booked me for because I don't normally do it. And so I'm about to come off stage and she shouts out... <laughs> Do do the Nazis and S and M, right? <laughs> I was like, no, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't normally do that. That's just something I did as like a one-off. And then the audience is like, no, no, do it, do the Nazis. And I was like, oh no. 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 And then uh, and I said, like, I really don't want to do Nazi jokes. And then all like the Germans, there's like two hundred Germans there. They all start going Nazi joke, <laughs> Nazi joke, right? And <laughs> oh god. <laughs> So, so I like, <laughs> and you're like, no, not again, no, stop, stop. This is the opposite of what should be happening. Yeah, and but I just sort of said, well, you know, Germany has changed, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> and, and that was that was the weird. It was like, you know, obviously it was funny, it was weird, but it was also quite unique. And I thought, well, you know, maybe some people want to hear about this strange, <laughs> this strange journey, which uh, which which I'm on. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's written with a lot. It's written with a lot of affection for 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 those years and and that and that time. Even though they are increasingly a bit of a way away. Hmm. Okay. Would you be willing to uh, read any extracts from your book for us? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, I have. I have the thing here. I've put a bookmark. I, I've chosen a bit, um, which is basically about how the main character, whose name is Stuart. Um, um, came to um, Germany uh, and how they came to learn German. Um, So basically Mm -hmm. this little section of a couple of minutes um, is about the attempts of the main character to learn the German language. Okay. I'll I'll try and read a bit slowly. Um, Okay. Okay. Uh, Because I have a tendency to start reading very fast. Um, Okay. So this is chapter two. Then a chance meeting in a pub had earned him an invitation to Berlin. Laura, Danish and short, was staying there for the summer, rummaging around in the archives for information about a particular Jewish family who had gone on to achieve cultural success in post-war Denmark. Laura, a snub-nosed Danish girl with glasses who loved Israel and wheat beer, Student didn't care. Stuart didn't care much about her interests, but did enjoy spending the days reading on her balcony and socialising with university friends at night. By the end of the summer, his hair had lengthened and his German increased fiftyfold, meaning he now knew about a hundred words. Hallo, he would say, then, Weltschmerz, and following a further pause, Auf Wiedersehen, saying a final farewell to people he would see again the next day. 
He also hadn't yet learnt to ask whether something was sugar or salt, leading to an evening eating some very sweet chips. But even speechless, he wasn't, at last, uneasy in Berlin. It seemed to him a gentle city, where the trains slid in and out and the open spaces pacified tourists drunker and rowdier elsewhere. It was like the Germans had become one of the peaceful races in Star Trek, the ones introduced by an insert screen of their orderly, verdant planet, Bajorans, say, or some other species permanently threatened by obliteration. And what a change after the tiny cubicles and traffic jam living of the English, who could only ever be the Borg. Surrounded by pacifists, Stuart reveled in the license of Englishness, his ability to voice the odd mildly aggressive opinion or wildly over-celebrate during the summer's football tournament until England lost. He swam in lakes and bought a bicycle and gradually stopped thinking of England and the ashes it had fed him. In Oxford, where he had been president of the University Sketch Review, people had printed gossip about him in the student newspapers, asked him to leave parties, dealt with him as the man who had committed that deepest and most unforgivable of Oxford crimes, failure. He had failed as a comedian and a young man, and that publicly, his country had rejected him. He had been humiliated in front of an audience of his contemporaries and sent into an internal exile. Afterwards, many of these young dilettantes, at the time apparently picturing future lives as bereft of unforeseen distress as possible, lives composed of simply an endless procession of success, successes occurring within a network of contacts which they had built up at university and which would continue to provide them with unstinting support throughout their adult lives, never violating the simple and essential principle that all was permissible as long as it did well, did not want his name on their social CV. Years later, he took out his stage trousers. He always bought a clean player for shows. Polyester was best on the road because it dried quickly. He stopped with them at half-mast, amused by his scrawny thigh hair in the elegant drawing room, then hoisted them all the way up. Funnily enough, though, nobody cared about Oxford drama in Berlin. The relative merits of his performance as director of the Oxford Review meant very little in his new country. Not only that, Said country seemed to be dealing with specific, and some might say more profound, issues of its own. Not that he thought much about those, as Germany faced him with his ample, unique modern annoyances, chiefly the natives' insistence on speaking English with him. Even ten years after his arrival, he would still be battling with the Ottos of this world and their expectation of free English tuition from their Anglophone guests, in a society which had apparently come to assume that English was the langage de choix with any foreigner. Apart from the Turks, now they could and should speak German. <laughs> Very nice, thank you. That was chapter two, or from chapter two. Um, in it, does your book have any uh, autobiographical elements to it, by any chance? Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's embarrassingly autobiographical, really. Um, I would say the key difference is that the main character is. Um, Stayed called in, Stuart. St- well, yeah, that would be the key difference, and that's the the the, the veil of fiction. He stayed in Germany, uh, and I came home. So he he lives his life in Germany, whereas I moved back to the UK ten years ago. So I suppose part of it is a bit of a thought experiment. What would have been like if I if I had if I had stayed in Germany? Mm, you talked about in Oxford there's failure. Was that uh, is that based on a true story? Did you were you part of a, the sort of a, a comedy team at Oxford, and what was it like? Yeah, I was the president of the Oxford Review. So again, another the Oxford Review. Yeah, is a sort of entertainment club at Oxford, sort of thing, a comedy team. Yeah, it's the fa- it's the famous one. It's the one which everybody wants to be part of with people like the Footlights. Yeah, it's the oh, that's, it's, is that Cambridge? Cambridge's Footlights. Oxford Review is is Oxford. The, the distinction has always been that Oxford Review has been worse than the Footlights. <laughs> <laughs> so for listeners, actually, this is a really important cultural thing, especially Footlights, because it does get mentioned a lot more. So uh, as listeners to this podcast will probably be aware, comedy in the UK is a huge thing. It's like a massive, significant cultural thing. Stand-up comedy on stage, but also TV comedy um, as well. And so Footlights is a sort of breeding ground. As we know, like Oxford and Cambridge produce a lot of the UK's sort of top talent. And uh, it's the same is true for comedy. A lot of people who have become sort of leading comics of the day of that generation went to Oxford or Cambridge and were part of either Footlights or the Oxford Review. And that includes 
Monty Python. Uh, they they were sort of split between the Oxford Review and uh, Cambridge Footlights. Also, Peter Cook, I think, wasn't he part of uh, Footlights yeah, at Cambridge? Yeah, Peter, Peter Cook. Peter Cook um, broke through pretty quickly. So by the when he was at university, he was already doing shows with the Footlights in the West End. But yeah, his his generation of um, Footlights is pretty legendary because it was like him, Jonathan Miller, Alan Bennett, the playwright, and Dudley Moore. Uh, and, and lots of others, including people like Stephen Fry, I think, and also um, David Mitchell. No, from, yeah, I think um, these. Are, I think these are all footlights, though. I think, like, I, I mean, Oxford Review is is Rowan Atkinson, and then from Pythons is is Michael Palin and Terry Jones. There are probably others as well. But anyway, so you were president of the Oxford Review. Wow. Yeah, um, and I write about it in the book because it all went a bit Pete Tong. There's a there's a nice it, thing for your <laughs> listeners. Uh, Pete. It Tong. all went. Pete Tong. Yeah, all went a bit Pete Tong. Uh, wrong. Uh, as, as it all he, went wrong. It all went wrong, yeah. Um, so that's a bit Cockney rhyme and stuff. Yeah, it went horribly wrong uh, in my year. Um, which How? Is, well, I mean, <laughs> if only there were a novel dealing with this, <laughs> dealing with this information. But no, <laughs> it, it was probably the most dramatic thing which has ever happened to me in my life, which is... Uh, dramatic or, or dramatic, traumatic? Yeah, well, but yeah. probably both. I mean, obviously, it is... It is student drama but um what happened in my edition was um there is every year an annual show at the oxford playhouse where the oxford review um does does the first hour and then the cambridge uh, footlights do the second hour um uh-huh. but in this year the cambridge footlights couldn't make it so it became oxford review versus not the oxford review which was a very bitter it was like the schism in the catholic church i think in insignificance it was like the split between <laughs> catholicism and, and the byzantine church uh, <laughs> it's the biggest thing that happened since then in terms of schisms, yeah i'd say um, I'd say. Yeah, and obviously, you know, time will tell whether that's a true statement. Um, but yeah, so basically it became this kind of horrible warfare between two student sketch groups, but it ended up with um, it ended up with um, the Oxford Review show uh, and the Not the Oxford Review um, part went on first and was very well received. And my part, who were the Oxford Review, went on. And uh, we, we got like heckled and jeered and about 150 people walked out uh, at the Oxford Playhouse, no. which is huge. I mean, it's like 500 seat, uh, you know, for a student drama, it's way bigger than... In fairness, I've only ever done since then one venue of a, of a comparable size with my, with my act. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously you've got me, I'm 21 years old, I'm the president of the Oxford Review, I've got all my friends, my family, everybody's come, this is, you know, you're going to be a comedy writer, you're going to be on the path to all these great people. And you'll be on the BBC You'll and be on the, the BBC, and what happened is, like, people shouted out, you're all shit, and walked out, and then after, oh, after, after, it, after it went down, I had a massive nervous breakdown and ran off to the Shetland Islands. Um, and then, really? and then they ran us some stuff in the student paper, which they really shouldn't have done about the fact that I was having a nervous breakdown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, you know, it was basically this enormous um, catastrophic thing to happen in a, a, a very early age. Now, I'm not saying I handled it very well, but in mitigation, I was 21 and full of shit. Yeah. So, so you know, it was it was a bit of a steep learning curve. Um, but yeah. Um, I wouldn't say I'm exactly glad uh, of it happening, but I do think that it's, um, I do think it's led me to uh, a, a good attitude to failure and success. It's just that it took a rather a long time uh, to, to get to that point. <laughs> it's a very important thing, though, to deal with failure and success. A lot of people, I mean, like some of the people you mentioned in that extract, just go on to have one success after another and they never experience failure, which is, you know, because things are kind of rigged for them in advance, you know, because they're, you know, they're part of the right family and this, that, and the other. And they probably work <laughs> as well. No, I know. mean, m- most of the really successful <laughs> people, people I've met are, are quite talented and hardworking. Um, uh, regrettably uh, but the one thing I would say is that I don't think I think very very few people have like completely unbroken success and what happens is if you've had that uh, like just a real like you're being a, nothing you can do wrong a bit like Peter Cook um, when you do have that first failure flop whatever you just have absolutely no tools to deal with it uh, right. and, and the, the good thing about having messing up uh, at a very early age is that you're like well 
whenever you do something you're like well this can always go wrong <laughs> you know yeah, 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 that, yeah that is always a possibility and you will be fine if it does because it's just a play or a book or whatever so that led you to Germany, which is sort of what we talked about before. And then you, and then there you were in Germany, kind of touring around doing comedy, uh, stand-up comedy. Um, what, what's the next uh, part of the book that you wanted to read out? Oh, sure. Well, I thought it's be- beautifully set up. It's like we're functioning on a deep psychic level this morning because the, the bit is I'm actually going to read out a bit of the comedy the main character Stuart does so okay. th- these these are basically um, jokes which would at that time have featured in my set um, you might need a little bit of knowledge about Germany to get to get them but let's let's see how they go and if any need explaining I can do that because that makes so is this funny. is is this Stuart on stage doing his material? He's in a pub in Heidelberg and he's doing his big his big jokes um, to, okay. to the crowd. Okay, so this is chapter 14. Don't you sometimes get the feeling, said Stuart, years before on the stage in Heidelberg, that if Barack Obama had been German, it wouldn't have been, yes, we can, but nein, das geht nicht. No, you can't. Everyone would have been chanting it. No, you can't. No, you can't. Of course, in this version, Obama would not have been black. Stuart was closing in on the kill. And this very lack of optimism, he said, treading across the stage, limbering into the really good stuff now, is actually built into the German language itself. Like, for example, when you're really happy in English, you say, I'm on cloud nine. But in Germany, you say, I'm on cloud seven. Does this mean that even in their happiest moments, Germans are two clouds less happy than English-speaking people? (laughs) And after developing that bit, which meant moving into a depiction of an exemplary German, Hannes, in his German heaven, with an allotment, board games, juice, and an autobahn heading directly to Mallorca, he noting somewhat wistfully the celebratory anglophones on Cloud9 who were dancing to Video Kill the Radio Star, which was an excuse to sing it, following which they, the anglophones, called down to Cloud8, Hey, Hannes, man, come and join us up here on Cloud9. And Hannes replying, No, thank you. Everything on Cloud7 is perfectly satisfactory. Then moving on to the speculation as to the occupants of the other clouds, the French on Cloud8 living it up, their motor scooters floating off the cloud and down to Cloud0, where the Greeks were and below then the Cypriots who'd had to sell the cloud and were just falling. After all these and other jokes, Stuart had them where he wanted him. Isn't it funny, since the Second World War, the Germans have been like, Jane's voice, German accent, we Germans, we have done so many things wrong and there is no way we can ever put them right. And now Greece is like, pause, turn of the head. Well, actually, they laughed <laughs> and laughed and laughed. They got it. Yay. The sound of a huge crowd of people all applauding you all at the same time. Nice. Okay. So, how did you find? How did you find German audiences? The the stereotype is that the Germans don't have a sense of humour, right? Uh, but is it true? Uh, no, of course it's not. Every every um, every every country's got a got a good sense of humour. Um, probably uh, quite quite similar in a in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. What the big difference is with German life and uk life i can't really speak to anywhere else because i haven't lived there uh is that germans go and do comedy at the comedy club or at the theater that's when you have your comedy you don't spend your work day making jokes whereas uh, in in the uk humor is a permanent social lubricant to any interaction uh, absolutely whereas if you do that in germany people will just develop headaches and be like well, <laughs> why are you making this more complicated with <laughs> i had a i had a german student once uh, who i remember he was he was really good and he did have a good sense of humor we had lots of fun uh, but i can't help uh, doing little jokes and being silly in my lessons i can't just do even an hour just normal i have to kind of there has to be some stupid thing in it and so you know that was going on in the lessons and everything and then i had to actually put a sign up on the board saying this is a joke um and i pointed at it and after a couple of days he was like okay so i have a suggestion maybe we can do 30 minutes of jokes at the beginning of the lesson 30 minutes of humor and then after that you know we stop and i was like 
you mean just ring fence it into a 30 minute this is funny time period and I just thought no sorry not possible I can't just the the idea of spontaneity is a little bit uh, missing there isn't it the idea of spontaneous (laughs) humour yeah but it's sweet though isn't it it's it's very sweet um so I was going to ask you, uh, sort of swinging this back to language learning again, I was wondering if, because you've taught English as well, right? Yeah, I still do. You still do. You're an English teacher as well as being yep. the other things. Yep. Yep. You're, you're trans- translator, comedian, writer as well. Yep. Um, so has being a teacher and a comedian and a writer, has this helped you to become a better language learner, do you think? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and also just really specifically teaching english helps mm. me to be a better writer as well uh because because it's 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 being able to explain things to other people is 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 a good way of um ex- explaining them to self to um you know understanding them yourself i think the i think the basic principle of of all this stuff is that teaching is about clear communication um and i think i think Einstein said, make things as simple as they can, but not any simpler, okay? So get things down to a point where your explanation is the maximum simplicity. And I think that is a good motto for both, you know, writing, learning languages, teaching, because it gets you to that point where you're like, okay, I I understand this to the point where I can explain it as simply as I can, um, mm-hmm. And obviously that when you're learning languages is you are trying for that clear communication, that effective communication, you know, and so it kind of mm. bo- it boils down your communication. Um, yeah. And I think that I think it's all it's all really helped. Going back to the book, how can people get a copy of this book? This is which is a story about, as you say, uh, Stuart, who goes to Germany after his experience in England and then the experiences he has and the stories he has to tell about doing his stand up there's there's another part to the to the book as well though isn't there there is yeah there's a second part um which is another character in berlin at the same time doug uh, and it's a story of a love affair which doug has so the book is in two parts the second part is quite a bit shorter um yeah. but it's a very different um side of living in berlin at the at the time so yeah i mean the 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 format of it is a little bit similar to Christopher Isherwood's book Goodbye to Berlin, which became um, the the musical Cabaret. Now I can't say I'm that influenced by it because I've never actually read it, um, but but um, but it is the book which I communicate to people. What's your book like? Well, it's a bit like Goodbye to Berlin. It's several stories set in Berlin about you know kind of expat life and 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 things like that and there is a a linking story in the in the middle of the book where um which connects the two and a bit which connects the two at the end so yeah the the second story is a tale of romance and heartbreak and and love no no Mm comedian no comedians in that bit no so you've got the comedy the comedian story and then the love story yeah is the love story autobiographical as well how did you guess? <laughs> How did you guess? Yeah, it is. It's highly autobiographical, um, again. But, again, fictionalised because um, the, the story in the book is set after um, the, 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 lo- the love affair. Um, yeah, so um, that, that is, it's, it's, all, uh, it's all pretty, pretty highly personal. Um, but I don't think it's, it's not raw, as a, as a book because it's something where i thought about it time has passed you know so it's not mm-hmm. um it's not me writing wounds which are kind of open in my life at the moment yeah okay so where can people get the book okay well um you can get it off amazon and there's two options you can have an uh, a kindle version or a paperback um wh- wh- whichever you want it's available in all amazon france amazon uk amazon us there's another way you can get it. Uh, if you sign up to my newsletter, Stiff Up mm-hmm. Equip, um, Stiff Up Equip, Stiff Up a Stiff Up Equip, Stiff Up Equip. Yeah, it's a weekly uh, email, 
Mm-hmm. But there is the option to become a paid subscriber, stiffupperquip.substack.com, stiffupperquip.substack.com. If you become a paid subscriber, um, which is either £4.50 a month or £45 a year, I think, uh, I'll send you a free copy. Ah, so yeah. that's nice. I'll, 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 Stiff I'll, I'll, upper, yeah, I'll links in the break. description, folks. Yeah, links in the description, links on the page for the episode, all the links that you could ever possibly need will all be available conveniently wherever you're listening to this podcast. Um, brilliant. Well, okay, good luck with the book, and I uh, hope Thank that you. you manage to sell it to as many people as possible. And I had one, I had one other thing to add, because last time I was on this podcast, you asked me if I had any tips for language learners, and I said... Or well, ask people to slow down, etc., etc. And I remembered mm. after that episode when I was on, I had another tip which I wanted to yes. give your listeners. Um, because um, one thing I used to find when I was learning German and other languages is when people asked me a question, like "Is that your coat?" or whatever, um, I would always repeat the question when someone asked me a question: "Is that my coat?" You know, and mm. that little moment of having a moment to repeat a question bought me some time to work out my answer okay and also to check that i'd understood the question <laughs> plus also you get to repeat the question every yeah. time so that's a little bit of practice too in exactly a, in a way. so it was a very specific thing but i just after we had our first chat i thought oh yeah that's something something that's something you missed useful. yeah so like excuse me is that your coat is, it, is that my coat uh, uh no it's not yeah, exactly. And you've got time because sometimes when you ha- if someone's asking you a question, you've never met the person before, you're a bit surprised. But you buy yourself a little bit of time to, to sort your answer out. Those little things where you can just buy time are very useful and important. Just little, little time-saving uh, memory or brain sort of enabling little tricks. Yeah. They're very useful. Absolutely. Yes. And that was a specific one. Anyway, it's been, lov- it's been lovely to be back on. You too, yeah. Lovely to have you back on. Yeah, and good luck with the book and all that stuff. Keep in touch. Yes. And uh, listeners, if you enjoyed listening to um, those little ex- story extracts, go and get a copy of the book. Yeah. You, or you, you can, the links are in the description. And you can follow me on Twitter as well, because then I'm going on about all the all the, all the the other stuff, and then you'll find out everything. But yeah, the sub Follow James on Twitter. The, the links will be in the description. Guess what, yeah. folks? Links in the description for everything. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, James. Have a lovely day. Yes, you too. Uh, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy Paris. I will indeed. All enjoy right. the southwest of London. All right, okay. mate. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye.